ערב טוב מבית שי עגנון בירושלים, אנחנו שמחים להמשיך את היום השלישי והאחרון של פסטיבל עגנון הבינלאומי הראשון. אנחנו כרגע נקיים אירוע שיח סופרים בשפה האנגלית, אבל מי שרוצה תרגום לעברית יכול ללחוץ על האינטרפטיישן, על הגלובוס, ולבחור בשפה העברית. Hello and welcome and good evening to our viewers and uh, participants abroad. Uh, this is the first international Agnon festival and we're very happy to be here with you. Um, I want to introduce you the moderator of this event, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, the head of the research in Agnon House. Hello, Jeffrey, and good evening. Hello, Asaf, and thank you for coordinating this wonderful three-day festival that we've been having. Uh, so much of it is due to your hard work, and uh, so far we're nearing the end. It's been a wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> And welcome to all of our viewers uh, around the world. Uh, I'm so delighted to be hosting this uh, session with, uh, with uh, authors, uh, friends, people whose who's, uh, writing I've come to, uh, to admire uh, from, uh, from Ukraine, from the old stomping grounds in Galicia, Agnon's hometown, Agnon's hometown of Buchach. Even though we're not all physically located in Buchach at the moment, we're going to pretend that we are. Uh, for the purposes uh, for the purposes tonight because as I often say about about the great writer Shai Agnon who, who left Buchach at around the age of 20 and aside from two and a half very short return visits essentially never stepped foot in Buchach uh, again uh, but nevertheless like so many great writers for whom place is so present in their prose Uh, you can take the boy out of Buchach, but you can't take the Buchach out of the boy. And for all of us who, uh, who love uh, Agnon's writings, there's a bit of Buchach in, uh, in, in, in all of us. Uh, before we turn to the uh, essence of our conversation with uh, Andre and Vasil, who I'll introduce in a moment, I am so delighted that our friends from the Ukrainian Jewish encounter are, are with us. Uh, their cooperation and their partnership in this event has been has been extremely important and we're very grateful for this and for the uh, wonderful relationship that we've developed with the Ukrainian Jewish encounter and with the Agnon Literary Center in Buchach, which is one of the flagship programs of uh, of the UJE and uh, we're delighted that you're here with us and I turn now to our friend to our friend uh, Natalia Feduchak who is the director of communications for UJE the Ukrainian Jewish encounter I would encourage all of you to visit their website uh, to learn more about the important work that they're doing but now over to you Natalia Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Before our panel begins, I'd like to say a few words about Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, one of the sponsors of the first International Agnon Festival. UJE is a privately organized Canadian charitable nonprofit organization launched in 2008 with the goal of strengthening mutual comprehension and solidarity between Ukrainians and Jews, two peoples who have lived on the territory of modern day Ukraine for over a millennium. Among our many initiatives is the support of literary festivals. These fairs have offered participants an opportunity to engage in a broad inter-ethnic inter dialogue by discussing publications supported by UJE, as well as those books and writers that strengthen and affirm the values we share. We are delighted to be part of the Agnon Festival and to build on a relationship started with the Jerusalem's Agnon House several years ago. Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs and the Ignon House have opened their doors to UJE and the Ignon Literary Center in Buchach and its director, Mariana Maximiak, who has worked tirelessly to promote Ignon's legacy in Ukraine and abroad, including through a writer's residence, also supported by our organization. Andrei Kurkov and Vasil Makhno are giants in Ukrainian literature, and it's an honor to be on this panel with them. Uh, Mr. Kurkov has worked closely with us to help craft a new literary award started last year by UJE called Encounter, the Ukrainian Jewish Literary Prize, of which Vasil Makhno was the first recipient with his epic novel, Eternal Calendar. 
I invite everyone to visit our website, ukrainianjewishencounter.org, to learn more about our organization and its activities. And there you will also find literary readings, videos, and other information dedicated to today's panel. So thank you, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you, UJE. And now we uh, turn to our friend in Ukraine, uh, Mariana Maxim. <laughs> I, I apologize for my bad pronunciation. Mariana Maximayak, uh, who's yeah. become such a good friend of, uh, of our work at Beit Agnon, both from her visits to Jerusalem, but maybe more so our visits to Buchach. In normal times, when we're not plagued with corona, uh, the Agnon house runs at least two trips in Agnon's footsteps, two trips a year. Uh, to uh, generally to Eastern Europe, and of course the visit to Ukraine and to Buchach uh, Elama is the uh, is the highlight of the of the trip. And uh, she's met with our groups uh, when we've been in Buchach. She's given us the kind of behind the scenes uh, tour of Agnon's home. And I'm pleased that uh, after we hear a few words from Mariana. Uh, we will actually see, we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to experience something of Buchach uh, through the screening of a very short film that uh, their organization has produced. And so I turn it over to you, Mariana, and then we'll go straight into the screening of the film clip. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, now I'm in Buchach uh, and greeting for you from this beautiful town, for everyone, um, it's really a honor for me to present the Agnon Literary Center from Ukraine in such festival. Um, the Agnon Literary Center was established six years ago in Buchach to study and to promote the literary heritage of Buchach and to commemorate a good memory of Shmuel Yosef Agnon. Our key project is the literary residency in Buchach. We are welcoming Ukrainian authors to have them learn more about uh, Agnon and more about Buchec. As a, a result of um, this project, today we have three books. Uh, this one, um, book of essays wrote about Ukrainian uh, writers based on the reflection about Agnon novel, A Guest for the Night. You can free download all these books on our website. I will give you a link in chat. In October 2018, we, have, uh, we had the opportunity to visit the Agnon House in Jerusalem with presentation of the Book of Faces uh, Key in the Pocket in Hebrew and English translations. That visit to Israel was with Ukrainian writer Sofia Andrukovich, uh, who was one of the participants of our residency. It was a very interesting journey, supported also by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, full of insights for me and for Sofia Andrukovich also. Today, I'm happy to introduce the Ukrainian writers Andriy Kurkov and Vasil Makhno. And speaking about Vasil Makhno, he was also the participant of Bucic Literary Residency two years ago. And now, uh, as Jeffrey said, I want to present you a short video from Bucic based on Agnon's novel, Guest for the Nine. Um, with the main locations connecting uh, to the Agnon's life in Bucic. Запрошуємо вас до Бучача, міста, в якому народився та про яке безліч разів писав Нобелівський лауреат з літератури Шмуїл Йосиф Агнон. Перед вами двір в одному із будинків на вулиці Агнона, в якому народився та певний час мешкав письменник. Сьогодні у цьому дворику вже впродовж десяти років діє простір арт двір. Відкрита мистецька сцена, яка запрошує усіх охочих щоліта. Будинки, які перед вами, автентичні. Вони збереглися з часів Другої світової війни і сьогодні є частиною довоєнної архітектури Бучача.
У межах дворику діє тематична літературна кав'яня. На вулиці можна побачити меморіальну дошку на будинку, в якому з свого часу мешкав Агнон, а також бюст письменнику, який було відкрито у 2016 році. Пропонуємо вам прогулянку бучачим тими місцями, про які писав у своєму романі «Гість на одну ніч» Шмуїль Йосип Агнон. Ось перед вами королівське джерело. Місце, де свого часу зупинявся напитися води король Ян Третій Собеський. А ось Бучацький замок, про який Агнон писав у романі. Місяць освітлює все. Сніг, руїни замку, а також каміння довкола руїн, укритих снігом. Я прислухаюся до своїх кроків та до булькотіння джерела попід пауэрбом. Це той пауэрб, до якого я часто ходив зі своїм батьком. Найбуде благословенно його пам'ять, щоб попити з нього води влітку напередодні шабату. Джерело, як завжди, булькотіло. Його води стікали до прального ставка, а звідтам до річки Стрипи, яка зараз вкрита кригою. Ми мандруємо будь-чим далі і потрапляємо на старий єврейський цвинтар. Це один з найдавніших та найбільших цвинтарів у Галичині, перші могили якого датуються другою половиною 16 століття. У романі «Гість на одну ніч» Агнон так описує це місце. Наш цвинтар спускається схилом і піднімається схилом. Він повен могил що, скупчившись, тісняться і штовхають одна одну. Я іду між могилами і ні про що не думаю, але двоє представників мого серця, мої очі, вони дивляться і бачать. Ці очі керовані серцем, а серце кероване тим, хто прирікає на смерть і дарує життя. Він дозволяє нам замислитися над живими, а іноді – над тими, хто вже помер. Поодаль від решти мерців старого цвинтаря видніється мішкан цадика. Дах мішкану знесли, а його стіни похилилися і ось-ось упадуть. Через два-три покоління від цього мавзолею не залишиться жодного сліду. Прийдешні покоління не знатимуть, що тут похований великий цадик. А він також забуде, що колись обіймав посаду Рабина у цьому місті. Річка Стрипа, про яку часто згадує Агнон у своїх текстах, розділяє Бучач на дві половини, кожна з яких становить частину старого міста. Письменник часто писав про міст над Стрипою, про ліси довкола Бучача, про красу цього містечка, його мешканців, вулиця, архітектуру та особливу атмосферу. Досі у місті збережена вулиця, що колись називалася гімназіальна. На ній зберігся будинок старої пошти, звідки Агнон молодим хлопцем надсилав свої вірші до відомих часописів. Збереглася давня вілла. Збереглася гімназія, де навчалася ціла низка відомих вихідців з Бучича. Зберігся палац для урочистих подій міста збудований у 1905 році. Агнон писав про Бучач. Змінився кожен клаптик землі, навіть проміжки між будинками. Усе стало не таким, яким бачилося мені, коли я був малим. Не таким, як привиділося мені у вісні перед приїздом. 
та аромат шибуча і ще не повністю вивітрився. Аромат звареного в медові пшона, який ніколи не полишає це містечко з дня юдейської пасхи і аж до листопада місяця, коли випадає сніг і ховає під собою все. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. As charming as uh, Buchach uh, is in this uh, video that we just watched, believe me, uh, to be there and to walk its streets, uh, if you could walk its streets carrying uh, uh, a guest for the night or or a uh, city in its fullness, Agnon's great works that describe uh, the town, uh, it, it's even more so. It comes more alive. When I visited for the first time a few years ago, I felt that I, I knew my way. I felt as if I had been there before, or in, in Agnon's term, you know, it had been shown to me in a dream. Uh, and I felt that I could navigate my way around the town just from having uh, known it, having having lived in it uh, within the book. So as, as charming as the, the movie was, uh, I, I do hope that you'll all have a chance to, to visit uh, sometime soon, uh, hopefully with us, with uh, the Agnon House on one of our upcoming trips. But now it is my uh, pleasure to introduce two of Ukraine's most celebrated authors. Andrei Kurkov is Ukraine's most widely translated author. He's published 19 novels, including the best-selling Death and the Penguin, and uh, and uh, most recently, uh, most recently uh, translated to English, Gray Bees. He has also written nine books for children, about twenty documentary fiction and TV uh, movie scripts, and uh, uh, his work, particularly in his most recent. Uh, novel looks at the current Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict, which is told through the prism of his signature surrealistic uh, humor, which I'll come back to momentarily. Kurkov is also uh, quite significantly the president of Penn Ukraine, the branch of the Worldwide Association of Writers, founded in London in 1921 to promote friendship and intellectual cooperation among writers everywhere. Vasil Machno, Makno is a Ukrainian poet, writer, playwright, and essayist who recently participated in the unique literary residency in Agnon's hometown Buchach and contributed to the volume of essays, Light on the Hills, in which he describes his acquaintance with Agnon's work and with his encounter with Emuna Yaron, Agnon's daughter and literary executor, when she visited, uh, when she visited Buchach years ago. Makno is the author of nine collections of poetry, including Winter Letters and Other Poems, and most recently, I Want to Be, Jazz, and Rock and Roll. He has also published books of essays and literary criticism. So we thank you both for joining us. Uh, Vasil, I want to start with you, and I want to spend a moment talking about this, you know, rather special program that uh, the Agnon Literary Center and the UJE sponsor of a literary residency for Ukrainian authors to go to Buchach. For those of us outside of Ukraine, uh, for those of us who are who are devotees of Agnon, we tend to think that Buchach obviously must be the most important, important spot in, in all of Ukraine, but that's not actually true. And as a matter of fact, uh, if, you're, if you're visiting uh, Kiev or Odessa and people ask you why you're here and you say you've come to make pilgrimage to Buchach, they may not necessarily even know where that is on the map. It is, after all, a, a rather a small town, but this initiative to take uh, to take writers such as yourself and to bring them to Buchach to spend time there to encounter Agnon's work on site. Uh, from all of the authors that I've read who've participated in it, and from my conversations uh, with you and with Sofia Andrakovich, who visited us in, in Jerusalem, it really has had a very special and profound impact. So I'd, I'd like to hear from you what that is, how you experienced that, and how it's left its fingerprints on your work. Thank you, Jeffrey. First of all, I would like to say thank you to be participating in the first uh, International Agno Festival. It's a wonderful opportunity to discuss one of the greatest writers of 20th century. My personal connection with Agnon began in my hometown, Ternopil. 
where many years ago I met his daughter Emuna Yaron. Uh, it was the uh, early 1990s. However, in that time, um, I didn't read any of Agnon's books because they weren't um, translated into other language uh, to which I could understand in that time. I remember Emuna and her husband arrived to Ukraine accompanied by small movie group from the French television channel, probably Antenne 2. And they had filmed a movie about uh, Joseph Shmuel Agnon and uh, journey his daughter to Europe. Um, we walked around uh, all part of Ternopil, Emuna, that uh, movie group, uh, his, her husband, and uh, one of the suburbs of Ternopil, we found a cemetery, Kirkut, where Emuna read inscription on Matsevot, finding her distant relatives. It's for, it, it's for me, it's like some kind of shock, you know? It's a long, long story. It's a- It, it could have been something in an Agnon story itself. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> At the end, uh, she left uh, me her Jerusalem address and we told each other goodbye. Of course, I could not have foreseen that two decades later, I would come to Jerusalem and be able to visit the house of Agnon. And especially that, uh, especially since the center of Agnon would be open in Buchech and allow inspiring writers to be invited to write the residence. As for me, um, you know, uh, from my, since uh, my childhood, I was familiar with Buchech. Because I was born in Short Kiev, it's a not, not so far from Bucha, probably 30 kilometers. And that land and the, that space, it's, uh, I, I now know from, from uh, my, I don't know, from my childhood. But um, when I arrived in Bucha um, um, in 2018, uh, I get an uh, uh, invitation to uh, literary residency. I, I was very happy because um, I learned more about Agnon and his place of birth. I think in, during this time, I think what was left after Agnon in Buchech, I think it is very little because the two world, world, uh, world wars, the first and second, Holocaust. And uh, I think that, that uh, ex my experience um, uh, in, in, in um, a residency, I rebuild this, my uh, childhood memory uh, and uh, my knowledge about artifacts of in Buchez probably from Agnon's time. Um, while in Buchez I thought about its unique history, preserved arch architecture and multicultural past. It is a very important right now since different political and social pro uh, processes are taking place, place in Ukraine. In general, the local history of Galicia has always been a material for poetry and prose. Um, in my opinion, the Buchech through Agnons has a chance to integrate uh, to Ukrainian Jewish dialogue about history, connection, and cultural heritage. Um, it do, it, and um, uh, staying in in uh, in uh, Buchech, I would ask myself, 
why do we need to rebuild Galicia? Why in this vanished world, uh, uh, disturbance in our memory? And answer, that answer is because the answers of our modern question are hidden in our past. How interesting. How interesting. I should just mention for some of our viewers, we talk about Galicia in the, in the Yiddish pronunciation, Galicia, as you pronounce it. Galicia was the easternmost uh, province of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time that Agnon was born and lived there at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. It is today, of course, part of uh, Western, Western uh, Ukraine, and that's the region that we're, that we're talking about. But if I can turn to you, Andre, uh, your most recent work uh, focuses on an area that's very far from Galicia, to the, uh, to the east of, of uh, contemporary Ukraine. And it deals, as I imagine so much of contemporary Ukrainian uh, literature does, with the conflict, with the war that's been raging in, in Crimea. In uh, Grey Bees, your, your most uh, recent novel, uh, which is available in a, in a, I should say, in a lovely, uh, uh, felicitous uh, translation, um, in the forward you mention that the world has largely forgotten about Ukraine and its war, and it always forgets about quiet, unfinished conflicts. The front line between Ukrainian troops and pro-Russian separatists in the breakaway, quote-unquote, uh, people's republics in the East uh, form a kind of gray zone, and that's the gray uh, of the title, uh, which really focuses on the life of, uh, which focuses on the life of, uh, of a beekeeper, of a kind of uh, older man, uh, Sergei, Sergei Sergeyevich, uh, who putters around with his bees, who, who actually takes his bees off on a kind of uh, summer vacation into this, uh, into this uh, gray zone. So I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that because it wouldn't be proper for us to spend an hour talking with, with Ukrainian authors and, and not make mention of the conflict, which is of course uh, still, uh, still uh, engaging and raging in that part of the world. But to talk a little bit about, to go back to that topic that we saw so, uh, so movingly depicted in, in the film a few moments ago, that question of place and prose and poetry and how that comes together in the in the author's mind and imagination particularly when it's a conflict torn sense of place uh, uh, thank you very much for the question and uh, i'm now filled with thoughts after i heard uh, uh, vasil's uh, talk about uh, uh, Chortkiv and uh, Bucic and i i love uh, galicia or galicia as you say uh, and uh, I know I should uh, tell you that actually I know Western Ukraine much better than I know Eastern Ukraine because uh, Western Ukraine attracts more uh, attention and desire to go there because they, you, you, you feel you will find a treasure there. Mm -hmm. And the Eastern Ukraine, I mean, th this is the region completely different where you go to feel a drama. And especially now, I'm at the moment in the States and I'm talking to Americans around me, if they know something about Ukraine, uh, and uh, I mean, I should tell you also that I mean, they, if they know something, they only know that it is somewhere in Europe. Right. And of course, I mean, the war is uh, not paid attention to here. And I was not going to write these books actually for four years ago. I went three times to the uh, front line zones, uh, visited both regions, Lugansk and Donetsk, with my colleagues, with Sergei Zhadan and couple of others and I talked to people there and the, the people there actually I mean they, they, they are not sorry to say they are not attached to the history of their region like people in Galicia Western Ukraine are attached to the history of the place they live. Uh, I decided to uh, write about this uh, situation actually situation is uh, what I mean life in the gray zone you, you should understand that gray zone is uh, has the same length as front line and front line in Donbass is 450 kilometers, almost 450 kilometers long. And there are thousands and thousands of people uh, detached from both sides 
and uh, trying to survive there and getting adapted to this kind of life of survival and trying at the same time in small ways to, 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 to cultivate the same kind of life they had, although it is impossible. And uh, I feel very sorry for, for the, the inhabitants of this region. Uh, and that's why I wanted to show uh, the, the drama and suffering of a person, maybe typical person from my point of view, who doesn't care about or didn't care about politics, it didn't care about ideology, didn't care about belonging except for regional belonging, because there the sense of regional patriotism was cultivated for many, many years, which comes always with the nostalgia, sort of pro-Soviet nostalgia. And uh, the idea of uh, uh, writing about retired miner who lives with his bees uh, having six beehives and with his enemy from childhood uh, and they are the only two remaining inhabitants of the abandoned village. I mean, it, it came to me after talking to refugees from Donbass who are actually also, I mean, they have lots of problems uh, to resettle in the mainland Ukraine or in Ukrainian Ukraine, but at the same time feeling very much pain for people who are left behind. I, I mean, I wanted to also, but with this book, uh, to fight the hate against people who left are left behind or are staying in this gray zone, because uh, we are coming or we came to the same level of uh, discussion in our society uh, that uh, that there are those and ours. There is a division, and the uh, and division actually comes uh, as a political division with political sympathies and as a frontline division. And we should understand that a lot of people who are behind this frontline, who are uh, uh, staying now living in the uh, occupied territories or breakaway so-called republics, I mean, they are not all enemies of Ukraine and they are, they are victims of the war, definitely they are victims of the situation. And uh, uh, we, we shouldn't accuse uh, each of them uh, in being a traitor. Etc. So, I mean, there are uh, several, I would say, humanitarian uh, messages in this book, but but generally, it is about what happens right. to people who have who who lived in gray zone before the war. I mean, uh, who didn't have in, in their uh, uh, mind understanding where they live. They didn't have any affiliation, great affiliation to the country they live, mm -hmm. and and only the war made them to decide and to, to, to think about uh, uh, the situation they find themselves in now. Let me, let, me, and let me ask you, if I understood you correctly, you didn't set out to write a novel about the conflict. You visited the conflict zone and somehow that made its way into your imaginative, creative process. Uh, and uh, through uh, the person uh, of this uh, Sergei in the book, uh, the story, became told? Yes, uh, yes and, and no, because uh, uh, I mean, I didn't want to, I was asked several times whether I'm going to write a book about the war or not, as probably any writer in Ukraine. And there were already books published. And can you imagine now there are 300 books about Donbass war and almost none about Crimean situation. But uh, I was uh, always answering that I cannot write about something which is unfinished. I mean, yeah. you need distance uh, from the real time effects. But I mean, then suddenly after talking to uh, one of the refugees who became a small businessman in Kiev, uh, and he told me that actually he goes every month to Donbass and trying to send medicament, medicaments uh, uh, and money and something else to people who, their friends who live in gray zone because they have no access. And uh, I just felt pain for these people. And I didn't want to write about battles and uh, heroes and superheroes. I wanted to touch on destinies of uh, ordinary people who found themselves living actually inside the war, inside the conflict. So let me let me throw a question back to both of you. I was reading something recently uh, uh, about the current, you know, worldwide uh, pandemic, the COVID pandemic, and the article was speculating on whether or not uh, hopefully we'll all survive and we'll be well and our health will return and the economies re will return worldwide and we'll be able to travel again without masks and all of that. But the question was when it's all over, 
Will any great art, theater, film, certainly literature, will any great art come out of it? Because it's not always obvious that trauma and conflict does produce great art. And the author of this uh, speculative article mentioned that in the 1918 pandemic, very little, at least in English, uh, very little uh, literature or art, uh, you know, came out of it. And then there are, of course, other traumas like the great wars, World War I, World War II, in the Jewish experience, certainly the Holocaust, which really did produce very long lasting and meaningful, uh, you know, literature and other types of artistic reflection. So in Ukraine today, uh, this conflict, which has been going on. And, and, you know, and as you point out, you know, sadly in the West, we, we largely ignore it. Um, what do you think the long lasting impact is? I know it's hard to, hard to make sense of when we're all like, uh, you know, the rats inside the maze without knowing how it's going to end. But what do you think the long lasting impact of of, you know, let's let's expand our scope. You know, the last uh, 30 years of Ukrainian history, how do you think that's going to leave its uh, impact on uh, the artistic culture of your nation? Uh, that's a question for both of you. Maybe Vasily will start and I will continue. <laughs> uh, I, I Vasil? Vasil? Vasil has oh, okay. uh, internet malfunctions. We're trying to... Uh, okay, so Andre, why don't we go back to you and, yeah. and we'll come back to us yeah. a little bit. You know, we, we have now a situation uh, of pandemics and the continuing war in Donbass and continuing annexation of Crimea. Uh, I do have a feeling that actually the war in Donbass will leave much more in, uh, in the sense of arts reflections uh, than the pandemics. Pandemic is almost natural. Mm -hmm. And actually pandemics sometimes I think can stop the wars. Not in our case, right. but, but generally, I mean, it depends whether pandemic is more powerful than the war inside or not. But what I noticed actually after 2014, the Ukrainian literature, even style of the books became much more masculine, much, much more militant. And uh, in this sense, Ukrainian prose loses a bit its uh, traditional poetic touch and uh, acquires some kind of more dynamic and more aggressive touch. Uh, so, so, I mean, we, we never had this uh, militant literature before. And now we have not only the books, but we have a generation of volunteers and war veterans who started writing about their experiences. And, uh, and I think this uh, literature will, will, will not take over completely, but uh, it has changed already the literary scene and it, it changes the mode of literature in Ukraine and the atmosphere. So, I mean, uh, to be more simple, we will have less love stories and more war stories. Uh, and uh, this will have an effect on readers and on next generations mm -hmm. and maybe even on mentality because this takes us back to Kazakh's mentality, to the mentality of people who uh, understand that at some point they have to defend their country, their territory, their culture. Mm -hmm. How interesting. Uh, Vasil, are you back with us or not yet? Not yet, unfortunately. Okay. So let oh, me yes, ask. Oh, there you are. Here you are. Yeah, Vasil is here. Vasil, had you heard the question that I posed? Uh, no, no. Uh, okay, so I had I had just asked. Uh, I'll I'll repeat it very uh, briefly. I had asked, uh, you know, going back, you know, to the 1990s, but certainly in light of the conflict of the last uh, few years, uh, I was curious about, you know, what you think the long-lasting impact of of these things will be on Ukrainian literature and culture. Um. Uh, that is a very interesting question because it's a um, very dangerous situation in our newest history because the war coming to us. And I, I, I see that that process of uh, in literature and connection 
um, uh, literature and war some kind of connection and describe this this uh, newest tragedy of uh, Ukrainian nation in contemporary time. Uh, uh, as I uh, as, uh, as said, uh, Andre, uh, according to Andre, that uh, published three hundred books, uh, poetry, prose, essays, etc., etc. That um, I think that uh, problem is in level of th this literature. The some kind of of uh, um, prose and poetry is very well. And some kind, it's uh, uh, like 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 only observation, only only uh, um, describe uh, war or, or uh, tragedy of our soldiers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That uh, in in um, in in the future, I think that will be uh, more uh, uh, understanding what happened with Ukraine uh, in the uh, 21st century. What happened between uh, Ukrainian-Russian relationship? Why we get in our territory, our land, we uh, have uh, war? It's, uh, it's a situation that um, is not unique, of course. But uh, I think in that uh, um, Ukrainian society is not ready for that. It's a, it's a kind of shock for many, many peoples in Donbass, in Lugansk and Galicia as well. That, uh, I, I should be that uh, situation is yes, for me, uh, 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 Continue because uh, because the Russia eject any proposition, any logistic proposition from from Europe Union, from uh, United States and uh, and Ukrainian government uh, um, and Ukrainian government. I want to I want to turn our conversation uh, back a little more to the uh, to the art of writing. To the thing that really unites us here here tonight, um, there's a, a curious parallel in some ways between Hebrew literature, at least in the period uh, uh, in which Agnon flourished, and contemporary Ukrainian literature. A part of Agnon's accomplishment as a writer uh, was helping to craft a newly reawoken language. Hebrew, this ancient language, which of course, you know, throughout 2000 years of Jewish diaspora remained the language of prayer and the language of holy Torah study, but was not a language of modern literature and had only in the generation or so before him reawoken. And with his arrival in the land of Israel in 1908 and his ascendancy as the shining star of this new reawoken or, or rebirthed modern Hebrew language, a language for literature, part of his accomplishment was helping to craft that language simultaneously as it's flowing out of his, his pen. To a certain degree, uh, there are parallels to Ukrainian culture because, you know, there's this oddity that you have Ukrainians today of a certain age who grew up at some degree of remove from their own language, because throughout the many decades of Soviet domination, Russian was the official language. And Ukraine, ethnically Ukrainian writers uh, living in, in that Soviet Republic were writing in, in Russian. And in the last few decades, there's been a return to Ukrainian as the language of the, of the nation. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, for how you how you view this. You're both uh, men of an age old enough to remember life under the Soviet domination. I know that Andre, you continue to write in Russian, and your work for the Ukrainian audience is translated into Ukrainian. And I'm curious about that process and how these things, you know, play out, you know, in your identities as authors. Yeah. Uh, can I? Uh... Allow me to correct you a bit. <laughs> I hope I will not. <laughs> no, certainly. You. 
Uh, yes, but uh, in 1983, uh, I was working as an editor uh, for Dnipro State Publishing House, and I was editing translations of uh, foreign novels into Ukrainian. And I uh, knew the situation inside the publishing system of Ukraine. And I should tell you that 90% of the books in Ukraine were published in Ukrainian language. The question was that all these books, which, which were written and published in Ukrainian, were, of course, books loyal to the communist ideology. And uh, for the Russian speakers, there was a quota like 5 to 10%. And the Russian language writers, uh, in Ukraine, uh, in the Soviet Ukraine, they were fighting each other who gets in, inside this quarter. And I was rejected a couple of times on the basis that I am too young and, uh, and I don't deserve to be published, not only because of my political uh, uh, ideas, but because also of the language. The uh, situation changed after the independence and the new generation came which revived the language, made the language real because I mean, the Soviet Ukrainian books they were like uh, uh, the books which were commissioned by state, bought by state for the libraries, and then recycled by the state to publish the same kind of books. So, I mean, we, we remember out of five or 10,000 of Ukrainian Soviet writers, we remember now maybe 12 or 15 names who were good writers, yes. Uh, I write novels in Ukrainian. I'm ethnic Russian. Uh, I grew up in Kyiv uh, at the time when Kyiv was 99% Russian speaking, yes. I, I write nonfiction in Ukrainian, but uh, fiction I write in Russian because this is my mother tongue and this is the language I feel uh, uh, well confident with. I can experiment. And uh, my first translation uh, into Ukrainian was in 2001 when The Death and the Penguin was translated into Ukrainian in order to, I think, it, in order to legitimize me as a Ukrainian author. Because, I mean, if you ask different Ukrainian intellectuals whether I'm Ukrainian author or not, some will tell you yes, and some will tell you no, because for, uh, for many Ukrainian intellectuals, the Ukrainian writer is only the writer who writes in Ukrainian. So minority language writers are not... So how, but how do you self-identify? I'm a Ukrainian writer who writes <laughs> in <laughs> Russian. <laughs> uh, and uh, I write about Ukraine. And what I write in Russian has nothing to do with Russia at all. In Russia, my books are not on sale, not published already for many, many years. And I'm sort of a traitor there. And I'm a, I'm a Ukrainian patriot. I'm not ethnic. I'm politically Ukrainian. So, I mean, wh whatever I write is about Ukraine. I reflect uh, what happens in Ukraine from my point of view, with my eyes, with my understanding. And my understanding is probably uh, is a bit different from the understanding of writers who live in Galicia or who live in uh, in Donbass, etc. I'm oh, right. It's, a, it's, a, it's from... naturally it's a large country with different yeah. subcultures. And, you know. Yes, but 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 I'm I'm very happy uh, to be a Ukrainian writer and to be a writer in Ukraine. I don't it's have such a, pressure. Such a I don't have... It's such a fascinating sense of self identity, and it shows exactly how complicated identity is: uh, individual identity, political yeah. identity, and art and and. And artistic identity. I often say about about Agnon, you know, who was of course, you know, the the premier Hebrew author. But Yiddish was his first language. Uh, he was fluent in Hebrew uh, from a very uh, young age and was already publishing uh, things in Hebrew as a as a teenager. But he was uh, he was a a Hebrew author that imbibed the raw materials on the shelves that you see behind me, the classic uh, canon of uh, Jewish literature, most of which is in Hebrew. Uh, he thought it through. It processed through the machine in his head in Yiddish and then came out again in a kind of newly reworked Agnonian Hebrew. And that's a rather complicated mix of things, particularly when you talk about uh, this, this author sitting in for much of his career uh, in Jerusalem, uh, but yet his mind is back in Galicia. His, his, his heart uh, is back in, his imagination is back in, in Galicia writing stories of, of Buchach. And it shows exactly how how complicated all of this all of this is. So, so uh, Vasil, did you want to? Yeah, uh, uh, I want to add some uh, some my opinion uh, about um, uh, Ukrainian language uh, in uh, Ukrainian space. It's a uh, Ukrainian. It's a, um, a very very uh, historical problem because 
um, during long time, uh, Ukraine, the territory of contemporary R Ukraine was divided between two um, imperium, uh, it's, uh, Russian imperium and Austro-Hungarian imperium. Of course, uh, in Russian imperium dominated space, used Russian language, in Austro-Hungarian, it's a German language and Polish. But uh, Ukrainian language um, uh, still live in uh, Ukrainian intellectuals, uh, in Ukrainian villagers, and uh, mm, uh, during 19th century, the Ukrainian intellectuals, especially Ivan Franko, Lesya Ukrainka, Mikhailo Grushevsky, uh, Mikhailo Dragomanov, etc., and a couple uh, people uh, more, uh, th thinking about new uh, state of Ukraine is not divided between uh, on the river Dnipro or Osbruj, but uh, united. And uh, many of them uh, make struggles uh, for use Ukrainian uh, uh, language in literature, in uh, scientist uh, book, etc., etc. Then, yes, of course, uh, after independence, uh, uh, after 1991, that uh, situation changed, and uh, Ukrainian. Uh, language is official, but uh, it's uh, uh, the euro, right? But de facto, we have a um, bilingual situation. Uh, and uh, the, this, this process uh, that many, many people uh, uh, in Ukraine used, uh, of course, Russian language, the vision. Uh, in Russian uh, news. Oh, I fear that we've lost Vasil again. Okay. Uh... Okay. Well, we're 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 almost uh, out of time, so I, I fear that we've lost Vasil. Um, but I'll just, Andre. Let me just turn to you for one last, very yeah. brief question. We only have a moment. I want to, I want to make mention of your important work with Penn. I, I happen to be uh, in the middle of the new Philip Roth biography, which of course has become uh, somewhat controversial for other reasons. But I won't go into that now. Mm -hmm. Roth, of course, uh, comes from. He hails from from Galicia. I mean, his grandparents hail from from Galicia. The opening, uh, the opening chapter describes or at least attempts to describe what Jewish life was uh, and how it was transported to Newark, New Jersey, uh, Roth's uh, stomping ground. But uh, for our purposes, you know, Roth uh, became very involved uh, with Penn, with the work of, of, of Penn, the organization that you had in, in Ukraine, um, uh, particularly in a time when uh, authors behind the Iron Curtain needed the support of a of an important voice uh, in, in the West. So it, just in a moment, could you tell us a little more about the work of Penn? Besides trying to foster fellowship among authors, it's also very involved in trying to promote uh, artistic liberties. Uh, so just in a, in, a, in a minute, it's important that we should give an endorsement to that important work and tell us about well, that. Yeah, I want to, uh, to say with pride that actually Ukrainian Penn is one of the most active Penn centers in the world with 140 members with a lot of projects uh, from residences uh, to campaigns to free uh, imprisoned uh, civil journalists in Crimea. Uh, we are uh, very much involved now with the uh, situation uh, in the next Crimea, but we are also part of international pen, so we're taking part in the campaigns to free imprisoned or persecuted writers and journalists worldwide. And uh, we run a lot of discussion roundtables and we organize trips of young writers in Ukraine to have discussions in small towns and bigger towns all around Ukraine. And now we are planning also several projects with different Ukrainian universities where Ukrainian writers will lecture on human rights and about literature and promote Ukrainian literature and world literature and promote freedom of expression, which is the main point of uh, 
our work also, because without freedom of expression, there will be no freedom of creativity and there will be no honest books. Well, thank you. Thank you for that work. Um, as we wrap up, I thank you both for your for your literary work. Uh, uh, I should say that uh, your, your two books, Grey Bees and uh, Death and the Penguin, are both widely available and are people that are participating with us both here in Israel and around the world. These, these books can be purchased uh, on Amazon, on other online uh, sites. They're available. Uh, Vasil's work is, is available as well. I should say that his essays for the Agno Literary Residency are available in English and in Hebrew translation and are freely available at the website of the UJE. And I recommend them and you can access them. And we look forward to a day when uh, all of your work will be available both in English and in Hebrew uh, so that our Hebrew uh, participants can can join us as well. Before we wrap up, I again thank our friends and partners at the UJE and at the Agnon Literary Center in, in Buchach, and of course, both to you, Andre and, and Vasil. And I just want to end with, uh, with oh, I see Vasil is back, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to quote Vasil for him. I'm going to quote him uh, for I'm him. So sorry with this. No, no, that's fine. But I want to, I want to end with a, with a lovely passage in your essay, uh, in, in one of your essays, In Light on the Hills, the volume produced by the literary residency. You write that the return to the Agnonesque Galicia, the Galicia of Agnon, is connected, at least for me, with a quest for authenticity. What kind of authenticity? You will ask, and I will begin to search for an answer along the crooked little streets of Buchach, the peeling houses with rusty openwork balconies, or even reach back to events of a deeper history. As Agnon did, when he created mythologized stories about Buchach. Authenticity remains above all in writing because over time, it is difficult to find another authenticity. So I thank you both because your words, I think really resonated with what, uh, what, what Vasil writes here, the authenticity of your work, the authenticity of your work as writers, as people that are struggling on behalf of your your nation and your national national culture. Uh, very, very important work, uh, work that resonates, of course, with what we try to do here at the, uh, at the Agnon House. And we look forward to other opportunities to meet together, to think together, to, to read together, to learn together. And we hope to see you in Jerusalem or to visit with you in, uh, in Ukraine or, or in New York. And, uh, and again, thank you to our partners. The, uh, the festival continues in a half hour at 8.30 p.m. Jerusalem time. That's 1.30 p.m. Eastern time in, uh, in the United States with the closing panel of conversation with contemporary researchers of Hebrew literature and Agnon's writings. So again, thank you all very much. And we continue in one half hour.